It is now uh, Wednesday of the uh, trip, and Mar May the 3rd, uh, 2017, we are in the Mariner's Museum, uh, and this is a Dahlgren gun from the uh, CSS Virginia, who was shot away by the Cumberland during, during uh, their battle on March the 8th, 1862. sank off of Cape Hatteras in uh, 1862 and wasn't discovered for over a hundred years. So this storyboard tells us that nine months after battling the CSS Virginia to a stalemate, the Monitor left Hampton Roads for Beaufort, North Carolina. Towing her was a side-wheel steamer of the USS Rhode Island. Just before midnight on December 30th, 1862, the little ironclad began to struggle in a moderate gale off of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, in an area known as the Graveyard of the Atlantic. So eventually the ship sank. Trumps them all. There's something, something about it that really gets to the human glue in all of us. We can get to the moon, so why can't we bring the monitor up from this relatively shallow depth of 235 feet and 16 miles off Cape Hatteras. Monitor sank in the graveyard of the Atlantic. The environmental conditions in that particular part off the East Coast are just horrendous for sailors, for boaters, and of course that includes divers. Those same conditions that came together back in 1862 um, were problems for us during the entire operation. Every person on that barge, over a hundred of us, were just completely emotionally and, and uh, personally committed to seeing that the Monitor's turret came up intact, its guns and all the other artifacts that would be part of the Monitor's story forever. About 50 feet from the bottom, you start to see the outline of the Monitor materializing through the murky water. And I just got goosebumps. Your words just can't describe you know, that first time of seeing it. It was just, I just, I wanted to get out and touch it. It just suddenly hit me that, my God, that's really the monitor's turret. You can talk about uh, great icons of the war, places, battlefields, ships, vessels, bullets, and buckles, but in the end, it's about people and all. Anything that helps us get closer to them and feel what they felt and understand what they were going through, perhaps even glimpse a window into their motivation as well as their daily lifestyle helps us come closer to what history is really all about. Tony Carisley, one of the contractor archaeologists working with us at NOAA, he pulled his work out we were looking at it and we saw initials on it and the more we looked at it, it said George Fredrickson. And I looked at Tony, I, I'll never forget that day, and I went, you know Fredrickson was one of the officers that died. It changed everything. I mean, no longer were we just raising a gun turret. We were literally about in our tomb. As was probably destined to happen, the end of the operation was um, coming close and the weather was just going to pieces. We both knew that there was still that element of risk that we could fail and we could let everybody down and the whole world would know that we, we destroyed part of history. I mean, literally, we were within five days of running out of funding. So it was kind of a case of now or never. I think I left fingernail marks and some of the iron railings on the side of the barge, and <laughs> then all of a sudden it was like, it's connected, we're ready to lift. In the water you just see this, this black silhouette. You had guys in the back going, go baby, go baby. And she came up broke the, the surface of the water and was greeted by probably one of the biggest cheers uh, North Carolina has heard in a long time um, when we all saw that she was still intact and she was just beautiful. 
it was one of the most beautiful pieces of rusty metal I've ever seen in my life. I had made myself and my ancestors a promise that I was going to go around the outside and touch every dent I could see, and I touched every dent. If an army officer is walking the fields of Gettysburg, they get this sense of their heritage. For a naval officer, standing next to the monitor just really gave me a sense of where I came from. I foresee a victory banquet of liberated Chesapeake oysters and imported French champagne. First ocean-going steamship is uh, launched in 1819. In, in 1841, the real U.S. Steam Navy was born. The USS Mississippi was a side-wheel steamer with 10 shell guns. Confederacy depends on raising an army in a strong navy. I wish you could see through these eyes. Born and reared near the sea, I have long observed the role naval might plays on the world stage. That wooden warship over there, the USS United States, received its new armament in the year of my birth. And now it's a lumbering, outdated hulk in my Confederate navy. How remarkable has been the advance of naval technology and armament in our lifetime. Though the future belongs to iron and not wood, it should be obvious to anyone who reads a newspaper. The Even more such ships can strike with each other. Even at our human force. Demonstrating to our friends and relatives that the future is strong and valuable. And no way can we match the federal government from gun and mass from Naval engagements between sport and frigates and they are now built at heart will prove to be the forlorn hopes of a sea center contest in which the question, not a victory, but who shall go to the bottom first is to be solved. Point about being better off. Our youthful foolishness, she will listen to our sick. This is a picture of the USS Michigan, a steam auxiliary iron gunboat, but anyone with eyes could tell she was really a hybrid sailing vessel. Launched in 1843, she had three masts and an iron built shape like the hull of a clipper bowed sailing ship. In 1855, uh, the USS Merrimack was launched near Boston. In 1850, in, in 1855, she was the Navy's first investment in screw propulsion and shell guns. The Merrimack was still basically a wooden ship, but she did mount 10 guns, including 24 powerful dog ones. Five other vessels, all named for American rivers, would ultimately make up the Merrimack class. The Colorado, the Minnesota, the Niagara, the Roanoke, and the Wabash. Three of them would have major roles to play in the looming war.
The Merrimack was named for the Merrimack River in New England, and therefore her name is correctly spelled with a K. This is uh, storyboards depicting the uh, Gosport Naval Yard, of course, which is down here in Virginia. And the Naval Yard was opened in 1833, and this is opposite uh, North, Norfolk, uh, Virginia. In, uh, in April, on April 20th, 1861, the Naval Yard is destroyed by U.S. troops. And these two pictures just depict the destruction of those ships. What you're looking at over here is what the below water, not well, below water and just above the water line guns would look like on the converted uh, CSS Virginia or the Merrimack. So this scene uh, that we're looking at with the men uh, on top of the uh, Merrimack is, uh, you get a glimpse of what the Navy Yard might have looked like in February of 1862 when the workers were toiling around the clock to complete the conversion of the USS Merrimack into the ironclad, the CSS Virginia. The dry dock had been filled with water and workmen are busy installing the uh, gun port shutters on the Virginia's casement. The venerable old frigate United States has also undergone a name change. She is now the receiving ship, the CR CSRS Confederate States. But the exhibit also tells the state of the navies at the outset of the war. At the start of the war, the United States Navy had uh, 90 ships. However, only 42 were in commission, and of those, 26 were overseas. The rest were either undergoing repairs or classified as unserviceable. Most of the nation's shipyards and industry needed to support the war effort. A centralized, well-established Navy naval administration a much larger population of seafaring men from which to replenish its force. The, the uh, Confederate Navy, by contrast, uh, had no central navy. Each state initially created its own independent navy at the outset of the war. The South could claim only a handful of small vessels such as revenue cutters, yachts, ferries, and tugboats, two shipyards, one in Norfolk and the other in New Orleans a limited merchant marine and a seafaring population. With the best dry dock in the country suddenly in their hands, the Confederates immediately set to work raising the scuttled Merrimack, as depicted here, and converted her into the ironclad CSS Virginia. The uh, strategic significance of Hampton Roads, both the Union and Confederacy wanted control of the deep water harbor of Hampton Roads. From the north, it, it offered access to the southern Atlantic coast, the target of Lincoln's Anaconda plan for the Confederates' control of the Hampton Roads meant direct access to the Earth Union capital of Washington, D.C., and to Baltimore, an important industrial and shipping center. Rivers running into the roads offered direct links to, to crucial Confederate sites. The Elizabeth River provided an avenue to Gosport Naval Yard and the James River led directly to the Confederate capital of Richmond. This is a map of uh, this is the Hampton Roads vicinity showing Confederate fortifications, settlements, 
city street patterns, roads, railroads, canals, streams, vegetation, and swamps. This, of course, depicts the uh, scene. Uh, Frank Baker, Shepard Mallory, and James Townsend may not have known that they were making history on the night of May the 23rd, 1861, when they were rowed across Hampton Roads to Fortress Monroe. What they did know was that they were willing to take their chances with the Union Army. They were escaped slaves. When their owner demanded their return under the rules of the Fugitive Slave Act, Major our old friend, Major General Benjamin Butler, pointed out that, that, that his Virginia was no longer part of the United States. The rules did not, did not apply. He declared the other three men contraband of war. Two of the gentlemen who designed and constructed the CSS Virginia, John Mercer Brook, Confederate Chief Naval Op Engineer, and John Luke. Porter, the Confederate Chief Naval Constructor. It's me to design an armed warship shortly after the war began. I therefore proposed an armored casemate atop an extended ship's hull. The casemate would consist of three inches of iron plate covering a two foot base of timber. To support this massive battery, I proposed extending the end of the vessel to prevent the swamping of her decks as she increased in speed. After the secretary approved my design, I asked that Mr. Porter be sent from the Navy Yard of Norfolk, as he had a reputation of being a, an adequate draftsman and a competent constructor. It is true that Lieutenant Brooke had made an attempt to come up with a design at the direction of Secretary Mallory, but he failed to produce anything but a rudimentary sketch. Upon my arrival in Richmond, I presented a model of an armored ship with the name Virginia upon it. But it became obvious that there was no time and no resources to construct a new vessel. Shortly thereafter, a board consisting of myself, Lieutenant Brooke, and Chief Engineer Williamson submitted for the Secretary's approval a plan to construct an iron battery atop the hull of the frigate Merrimack. Though burned and scuttled by the enemy, she had recently been raised and dry docked at Gosport. This appeared our only chance to get a suitable vessel in a short time. Construction began in July of 61. This is the design features of the CSS Virginia sloped casement. One of the most unique features of the Virginia was her sloping armor. The casement design based on the Bernard principle of 36 inch slope was a radical departure from the more upright walls of a wooden warship. As I've read in several books, uh, there is no picture, photograph of the uh, uh, Virginia. Again, this is another drawing as she's being reconverted. The Merrimack is being converted to the CSS Virginia. It's uh, the storyboard here depicts the construction delays on the CSS Virginia. The Virginia had a sizable head start on the monitor, but the Confederate States ran into problem after problem, beginning with a shortage of skilled workmen. Eventually, three ships of more than 1,500 work men worked around the clock to finish the ironclad, but design changes, material shortages, and transportation snags delayed the project so that the ship was supposed to have been launched in November of 1861, but instead it was launched on February 17th, or 17, 17th, 1862, more than two weeks after the monitor. We are now inside a uh, inside the Virginia a reconstruction of what it must have looked like.
talking about the pilot house on top of the uh, CSS Virginia. Seeing through the CSS Virginia was not easy. The pilot house, a conical cast iron structure protruding from the top of the casement, was designed for protection, not, not easy viewing. In order to see out, the captain had to stand on a platform inside the gun deck. When the Virginia was underway, the platform might hold the captain and his lieutenant and one or two pilots. Acting Master William Parrish served as a principal pilot of the Virginia. He was assisted by four civilian pilots, William Clark, Thomas Cunningham, Ezekiel Williams, and George Wright. Flag officer Franklin Buchanan, for a while no one knew for sure what Maryland would do. Flag officer Franklin Buchanan, the 61-year-old Maryland Navy and a career Navy officer, resigned his U.S. Navy commission when it appeared that his home state would secede in April 1861, when Maryland did not succeed. Buchanan applied for reinstatement, but Federal Navy Secretary Gideon Wells turned him down. Buchanan then joined the Confederate Navy and Mallory quickly named him commander of the James River defenses. The CSS Virginia was his flagship. Austin. The men are covered with powder and dirt and blood. Visitors who have come to the Virginia to congratulate us bring rumors of a strange looking Yankee ship steaming this way rest now before seeing what the dawn brings. We have won a great victory today for the South. Lieutenant Jones will finish off the fleet tomorrow as I am to go ashore shortly. However, with the scourge of this federal blockade gone from Hampton Roads, we shall reclaim the entire Chesapeake and show the world that the Confederacy cannot be subdued or starved into submission. This new type of vessel, proclaiming a new naval dominance, shall steam up the bay to my native Maryland, driving the enemy before us. I am not a Navy man. Just before the hostilities at Fort Sumter, we formed an artillery unit from our volunteer fire company in Norfolk, and I was appointed captain. We all volunteered to come aboard the Virginia just two days ago. My nephew John is with me and serving bravely as a powder boy. I was placed in command of gun number nine. We steamed out of Gosport this morning and crowds lined the banks of the river to watch. Some cheered, others looked amazed that such a vessel could even exist. One man chastised us for the folly of going to sea in a metallic coffin, but it was the ships of the enemy that became their wooden tombs decks awash in water and blood, piled high with the shattered timbers and dead and dying men. Load and fire, load and fire, heat and smoke and cursing and cheering. It seemed as if every shell we fired found its mark. Meanwhile, despite the din, we could hear the enemy's fire bouncing off our iron with no effect. Despite the difficulty in maneuvering the vessel, I am elated with her performance in battle. The Cumberland is at the bottom, the Congress is ablaze, and we control the roads. It would have given me great pleasure to crush their remaining fleet and raise their shore batteries, but now I shall have to view the triumph through a spyglass in the hospital, because those damn rascals are without honor and care nothing for the civilized rules of war. They fired upon a, a white flag, by God. When the Congress struck her colors, I dispatched boats to accept her surrender and to take charge of her prisoners. They fired upon boats from the shore. In all the years I served under the old flag, not once, not once, did I witness such a craven act of cowards? I called for a rifle so I could meet lead with lead. Even after a ball struck me, 
I own a pot shot poured into the carcass without hesitation. Though my brother serves as a paymaster on that same vessel, such an affront cannot be excused. I must go now. But tonight, our beloved Confederacy rules the sea. This storyboard, of uh, course, the picture is familiar because this is the USS Kalina that uh, that goes up the James River to attack Fort Drury. Naval constructor Sam Samuel Pook. Could anyone call that engagement a draw? Why, Secretary Stanton himself feared that rebel ship, the Merrimack, would steam John up Erickson. the Potomac and put a shell through the White House window. But my little monitor, outmanned and outgunned five to one, played David to that rebel Goliath, besting her at every turn until she finally drew off. Where is the boogeyman now, huh? A draw. Bah! The brilliance was in her design. Everything about her was revolutionary. Hull, gun turret, engine, gun carriages, even the anchor hoist, all designed by my own hand. Well, there was that money they insisted be paid to Timby for his rotating towers, but mine was the first on a warship. For years I have been waiting to build such a ship that could carry out a just retribution against the enemy. And built she was in less than 100 days. Of course, those bureaucratic simpletons at the ironclad board at first refused to see the merits of her design. They even had the audacity to question my calculations of her displacement and did not believe her seaworthy. My calculations. I, who went to sea at 13 and have been designing engines since before I was old enough to shave, and they wished her to carry spar on sail. I paid no attention to that ridiculous clause in the contract. The sea shall ride over her, and she will live in it like a duck, I said. The board insisted on a guarantee of her performance. If I had known that, I would never have accepted the contract. Well, now I have a contract for six more of my little ducks, and no one is asking for a guarantee. There were those who wrung their hands and wagged their heads at the prospect of a warship with only two guns. My revolving turret gave her the firepower of ten times that amount. I called for her armor to be nowhere less than five inches, but nine inches where it mattered the most. Rebel fire was no more effective against her than a child's pea shooter. Oh. How I wish I could have seen it myself. That improvised monstrosity, the Merrimack, or the Virginia, as the rebels rechristened her. A bulky, unwieldy behemoth clumsily trying to destroy my monitor. For four hours, my invention outmaneuvered and pounded at the giant like, like a cooper fastening stays around the cask until the rebels refused to continue the fight. The Merrimack's mission of destruction stopped dead in her tracks by my beautiful invention. What some call a floating cheese box, a tin can on a shingle, or even Erickson's folly. <laughs> I chose to call her the monitor, 
to admonish and chastise southern leaders for starting this rebellion. I pray she and her sisters will prove a severe monitor to them indeed. This uh, depicts uh, Erickson uh, before the video we just saw. He's, uh, he's in England and uh, trying to get some, selling his designs. And his talents came to, caught the eye of American Naval Officer Robert Stockton, who invited Erickson to become, to come to the United States. <clears throat> and unfortunately, uh, his relationship with the U.S. Navy appeared to be promising, but then came to an abrupt end when the, with the 1844 USS Princeton tragedy, with that avenue where, where there was an explosion on the Princeton killing some cabinet officials. Of course, Eric, it wasn't Erickson's, all of Erickson's doing, but Erickson suffered much of the blame. Coffee and tea. This is uh, what we're stepping into now is a recreation of the, uh, of the cabin, uh, cabin facilities on the USS Monitor. Experiences. Card playing is not allowed on board a man of war, so we cannot make use of that to kill time. So, stories are told and jokes cracked till 10 when all on board must be quiet. Coffee and tea. This is uh, what we're stepping into now is a recreation of the... Uh, Fight their battles uh, the cabin, uh, cabin facilities on the USS Monitor. Experiences. Card playing is not allowed on board a man of war, so we cannot make use of that to kill time. So, stories are told and jokes cracked till 10 when all on board must be quiet. I had to laugh when I came to where you hope I will be allowed to read your letters in quiet. For in the cabin were the captain, engineer Steimers, and one or two more discussing ironclad ships. In the doctor's room, from which I am separated by only a blind door, are a half dozen alternately spouting ships. Acting Assistant Paymaster William Keeler. And other places speaking. not quite as regular. While another in a room at my side. This is the uh, surgeon's captain. By reading in a loud tone the persons of the New York Herald interspersed with intended witnesses. Last. The storyboard uh, portrays the uh, 100 days to build a warship, which is what they took to build the uh, USS Monitor. The contracts with, that were signed, uh, the Navy terms were strict. They included a money-back guarantee if the vessel failed in any way, and a requirement for space to store provisions and fuel for, for up to three months. The vessel would be 179 feet long and 41 feet wide and be built for $275,000. But most surprising, the contract contained a requirement for mast, sails, and rigging which would defeat the ship's most important design feature, her revolving turret. True to form, Erickson simply ignored the various terms of the contract that he did not like. And again, this is the model of the, of the, uh, of the monitor. Everything about the ironclad was Erickson's idea. Throughout the construction, the ship had been referred to as Erickson's battery. In a letter to Assistant Secretary of the Navy Gustavus Fox, Erickson wrote that, that the impregnable and aggressive character of the ship will admonish the leaders of the Southern Rebellion that their batteries will no longer be present barriers to the entrance of Union forces. The ironclad intruder would, will thus prove a severe monitor the name stuck, and on January 20th, 1862, the ironclad beca became the U.S. S monitor.
with much love to this you This is the cabin of uh, Executive Dana Officer Trump. Lieutenant Samuel yeah. Dana Green. Green was second in command on the ship and gave orders to the gun crew in the turret during the Battle of Hampton Roads. He March took over command of the ship when Lieutenant Warden was following. wounded during the battle, on but Thursday, a more senior officer replaced him the next day. The gunboats Sachem and Turretuck. We went out past the Narrows with a light wind from the west and very smooth water. The weather continued the same all Thursday night. I turned out at 6 o'clock on Friday morning. And from Word of what had happened uh, in Hampton Roads on March 9th quickly spread far and wide, both north and south claimed victory, saying the other had broken off the, the fight first. Both ships' crews were eager to meet again. <clears throat> Today, most scholars believe that the battle ended in a draw, that the two ironclads resumed, remained in Hampton Roads for several months, but they never met in battle again. And by the end of 1862, both had left the scene as dramatically as they had entered. Global reaction to the battle was swift. When the CSS Virginia took on the Federal Fleet on March 8th, it was plain to see that the age of sail was over. And when the USS Monitor took on the Virginia the next day, the fate of wooden ships was sealed. The great global ironclad race had begun. What you're looking at now is the actual ship's wheel from the CSS Virginia. Now when uh, the Union troops advanced in early May, Confederate Major General Benjamin Huge abandoned Norfolk in such haste that on the 9th uh, of May he forgot to inform the Virginia of the evacuation. Unable to withstand the guns of Fortress Monroe, the Virginia could not make it out of Hampton Roads. Her deep draft precluded her from going up the James River. Even with all the spare provisions, water, and ballast thrown overboard, she could not risk capture. She must be destroyed. Chief Engineer Ashton Ramsey recalled how with mingled pride and grief we gave her to the flames. The Virginia burned for several hours before exploding spectacularly on May 11th. A court-martial held in Richmond on July 5th, 1862, granted Tatnall an honorable acquittal for the destruction of the Virginia, stating that the scuttling was deliberately and wisely done. So this, this uh, drawing that you're looking at now is the uh, explosion of the rebel steamer Merrimack. These are items or artifacts off the uh, Virginia. Iron plating, uh, miniature tab made by a sailor, possibly of wood from the Virginia. Result of uh, the ironclads, uh, the battle after May March 9th, both North and South put their ironclad building programs on the fast track. Over the course of the war, the, the Union would build 64 monitors and 19 other armored vessels. The Confederacy would build 22 casement rams of the of the 40 ironclads that built or bought, some vessels were more successful than others, but most were plagued by problems in the same areas as their prototypes, speed, power, stability, seaworthiness, and, and uh, draft. These are the Dahlgrens of the guns in, on the monitors. In action, the hot, loud, and smoke-filled turret was an assault on the senses during the battle. So this is the, uh, you are now standing on the ceiling of the USS Monitor's recreated gun turret. Keep in mind that the turret was upside down when it was recovered and will remain upside down until it was, until it was fully conserved. And you can 
see the gun and the carriage right here. So this is an excavation. Um, when excavations began, the archaeologists divided the turret into quadrants based on the clock face. The area in front of you was the 12 to 9 quadrant and the 9 to 6 right quadrant. The 9 to 6 quadrants was where the largest concentration of artifacts was found, and uh, including the skeleton remains of two of the USS Monitor's crewmen. As the excavation continued, the archaeologists were further surprised when they encountered flatware scattered among the roof rails. You can see a drawing of what they found in the skeleton remains. And this is a depiction of it. And the gun is uh, carriages, obviously, upside down. What we're looking at now is a recreation of what the uh, gun turret would have looked like. And the, the turret was raised um, on August 5th, 2002. Uh, recovered from 240 feet below the ocean surface off the coast of uh, Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. This uh, depicts on the side uh, or a cutaway of the of the monitor and you can see the various there's really one inch plates iron plate up here so you can see the very there's like eight to nine sections of this iron plating. fills the different uh, things, but here's that shaft there. Neat, huh? Here you go. So we have a storyboard here that in front of you is a glass plate representation of the USS Monitor's vibrating side lever engine. Erickson's design was revolutionary because he turned the engine on its side, greatly reducing its height by allowing the, the pistons to move horizontally. Formerly steam, in, steam engine pistons had operated in a vertical motion which took up a great deal of space in a warship. These engines were vulnerable to enemy fire since they were higher than the vessel's waterline. Ericsson's new engine could be mounted below the waterline, safe from enemy fire. And this is a this is a drawing of it. And then here is inside the monitor. Built in just 98 days, it contained 40 patentable devices. Here's the turret. Uh, they, they're saying here that these schematics are redrawn from Erickson's original blueprints. Uh, we're in the museum, of course, and now we're below the uh, turret. turret. So what you're looking at now is the uh, what would be the coal bin of the ship. So here we are at the uh, replica of the uh, monitor.
This is the uh, plaque that uh, the christens the uh, what we're standing on, the monitor. It's a replica designed and built by the Newport News Shipbuilding, a division of Huntington Engels Industry, christened June 11, 2006. And they can rock this back and forth. You see what I'm saying? You understand? Yeah, so this is a device that would have actually picked it up. That actually, they hooked it on, lifted it, put the base under it, then these, these uh, pins uh, held it. Then they could put these second pins in, and then that holds these legs rigid. There. So what are we looking at here, Jim? What we're looking at is the turret which is uh, eight inches of one inch uh, iron. It's upside down and it's in a solution that's removing the salinity of 140 years in the Atlantic. And they constantly monitor the acidity uh, to determine when they'll be able to expose this to the air. Okay, so we have finished up at the museum and of course we wanted to come back and take a shot of the entryway, a uh, statue of Leif Erikson and the maritime flags in the background. I mean, people don't even realize if you if you're we are now in the uh, York story, County you courthouse. Get flour. Uh, oh, yeah. And this building was used as a courthouse very, very uh, from 1697 to 1997. During the Civil War, uh, the York County Courthouse was used by the Union. And there was a the building was literally blown off its foundation on December 16, 1863, by an explosion of Union Army gunpowder stored in the chambers during the Civil War. I can give you a quick rundown. Okay. Okay, based on power plant here during World War I, World War Naval Mine Depot here during World War II, which was renamed the Naval Weapons Station and is still here. Uh, this particular candidate, though, has nothing to do with the military. The, uh, back in the 1600s, uh, uh, they gave this land to a was uh, used during the Civil War. There was an explosion but, uh, that blew it to office foundations it for some gunpowder that was stored in the chambers during the was not replaced. And, uh, about 10 went years away and blew up. Just went in. We fought on. The Lord was on our side. What you're looking at in the uh, distance is the victory column commemorating the victory at Yorktown. Signage here tells us that just 10 days after the victory at Yorktown, the Continental Congress directed an American, directed a monument to be built to commemorate the siege and the American French alliance. However, funds were not legislated for its construction until 1880, as the centennial anniversary of the battle approached. And here is a ceremony of the laying of the cornerstone. And uh, under and, and President uh, Chester Arthur was present in uh, to at the ceremony at the time. We're just down from the uh, monument and what you are looking at is the York River. And the monument reads at York on October the 19th, 1781, after a siege of 19 days by 5,500 American and 7,000 French troops of the line, 3,500 Virginia militia, under command of General Thomas Nelson, 
and 35 French ships of war. Earl Cornwallis, commander of the British forces at York and Gloucester, surrendered his army of 7,251 officers and men and 840 seamen, 244 cannon and 24 standards to His Excellency George Washington, Commander-in-Chief of the Combined Forces of America and France, to His Excellency the Comte de Rochambeau, commanding the auxiliary troops of the most Christian man, Majesty in America, and to His Excellency, oops, whatever, the Comte de Grasse, commanding in chief of the Naval Army of France in Chesapeake. We have now arrived at the Virginia State Capitol and we are greeted by Jefferson. Most unique architecture. All of Mr. Jefferson's designs. Look at the ceiling. Look at the corners of the ceiling. It's curved. It's called the cold ceiling. And with the overhanging rafters on all four walls, when you were in this room, Mr. Jefferson wanted you to feel that you were in an open room in courtyard. This room also gives you the exact dimensions of Thomas Jefferson's original from that eastern wall to the western wall, this is the exact width of Mr. Jefferson's original capital. From the northern wall, through the rotunda to the front door, the exact length of Mr. Jefferson's original capital. So you can see it wasn't such a large building. However, you could call this room a hall of debates, for it was in this room that John Marshall presided over his court. John Marshall served as Chief Justice of the United States longer than any other man. He was Chief Justice for 34 years. It was right in this room that Marshall presided over the treason trial of Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr at that time, Vice President, charged with treason. Marshall said the evidence was insufficient and Burr was acquitted. This marble bust behind me with the toga effect is the bust of John Marshall. John Marshall lived just three blocks from the Capitol, lived on the northwest corner of Ninth and Marshall Street. Next to Mr. Marshall in bronze, we have a young man who made a very powerful speech in 1775. Speech was so powerful, it incited the American Revolution. He said, I don't know about you, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. And that speech was made by Patrick Henry. Speech was made at the historic St. John's Episcopal Church, located at 24th and East Broadway. Church was built in 1741, but in 1775, it was the largest building in Richmond. Thus the site, Second Virginia Convention. Now they've added to that building twice since Patrick Henry made the famous speech, but if you were to ride by today, you'd still think it was just a postage stamp. In the corner in Marvel, we've got the first law professor in the New World. He taught at the College of William and Mary. He taught all of your leading lawyers, John Marshall, Patrick Henry, Thomas Jefferson, Henry Clay, you name them, he taught them. He also was one of the Virginia signers of the Declaration of Independence. That's George Wythe. Now, George Wythe is buried in the churchyard where Patrick Henry made the famous speech, as is a gallery poet's mother, Elizabeth Bonnie Pope. Under the gallery in bronze, we got one of the soldiers from the Civil War on the war in the States, Thomas Stonewall Jackson. You roll along Monument Avenue today? All right. Yeah. Stonewall's Monument is at the intersection of Boulevard and Monument. Just shy of the staircase, we got a frontier. That is Andrew Lewis. Andrew Lewis served under General 
George Washington. Back to the Confederacy in marble with the full view. James, Ewell, Brown, Stewart, such a long name, they shot me to his initials, Jeff Stewart. Jeff Stewart's monument starts the procession along Monument Avenue. He's at the intersection of Lombardy and Monument. In the niche, Jefferson Davis, first and only president of the Confederate State. Mr. Maury is known as the pathfinder of the seas. He fought during the Civil War, but was injured, had to take a desk job. But throughout the Civil War, 1861 to 1865, he made maps of the rivers and oceans all over the world. The maps were so accurate. They were used during the version of the command of the Northern Virginia troops. He took six steps into this room, and that's the exact spot he stood on when he accepted that command. On that day, he would have on a black business suit. Here today, you see him posed in his Confederate Army uniform. Broad shoulders, narrow hips, a very small foot wore a size seven shoe. Lee stood 5'11", but in this rendition, the artist made him 6'1". <laughs> the one unique feature about that statue, those eyes. No matter where you move in front of that statue, the eyes seem to follow you. To the right of the door, General Joseph Johnston, and in the niche, Alexander Stevens. Mr. Stevens was Jefferson Davis's vice president, and Stevens was born in Georgia. Just shy of the balcony on that side in marble, with the beautiful epaulets on his shoulders, General Fitzhugh Lee. Fitzhugh Lee served as one of our governors. He also was the nephew of Robert E. Lee. Just shy of the staircase in marble, Mary Weather Lewis from the Lewis Clock Expedition. Under the gallery in bronze, Cyrus McCormick. That's the McCormick invented the Grand Reaper, born in Rockbridge County, Virginia. Do we have anybody in the room from Texas? Oh, I'm so cool. <laughs> <laughs> they usually get in a fight with the Texans on our tours. But just the Texans get really upset when we introduce the bus in the corner. That's Sam Houston. They want to know, well, why does the Commonwealth of Virginia have a bus of Sam Houston? We have to let them know that Sam Houston was born in Rockbridge County, Virginia. Uh -huh. He left Virginia, became the governor of Tennessee before he became the president of the Texas Republic. They usually come in with their eyes and mouths wide open. They usually leave with their eyes and mouths open. <laughs> we'll let you stay. <laughs> Coming up that north wall, just shy of the balcony in marble, another of the Virginia signs of the Declaration of Independence, that's Richard Henry Lee. But Richard Henry Lee, his brother, Francis Lightfoot Lee, had the distinction of being the only brothers to sign the Declaration of Independence. We met this gentleman in the Jefferson room, that's George Mason. He wrote the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which became a part of our national constitution. Here in the case, we've got a mace. A mace in olden days was used as a weapon. It had spikes on it. Whenever the king came out among the people, bodyguard would come out carrying the mace. And if you got too close to the king, bop you over the head and get you out of the way. Today, the mace represents governmental authority and power. I would love to tell you that this is our original mace, but our original mace was girl in silk. It was sold to a silversmith shop, melted down, and made into something else. South Carolina is the only state that <laughs> our original mace. This mace was given to the Commonwealth by the Jamestown Foundation. It also is still in silver, but it has a 24 karat gold wash on the outside. And it's a good thing that it's still in silver. That means it doesn't weigh a whole lot. It only weighs 10 pounds. 
It is still being used by our House of Delegates today. Every day before the General Assembly convenes, the Sergeant at Arms from the House comes up that corridor, comes into this room, puts on white gloves, unlocks three locks, turns off the burglar alarm, reaches in, gets that mace, walks out of this room very ceremoniously. When he gets to the house chamber, he stands in the back of the room. The first order of business with the sergeant at arms, please present the mace. That time a gentleman walks down the aisle, he presents that mace to the delegates. It sits on an extension of the speaker's desk throughout the session. Now the Virginia General Assembly is a part-time General Assembly. On the odd years, they meet for 45 days. So 45 times down with the mace, 45 times back with the mace. On the even years, they meet for 60 days. 60 times down with the mace, 60 times back. Are there any questions you want to ask about the uh, old house chain? Well, so that's the last one. Oh, and then this this is a nice shot. This is a building, obviously, we were just in. This is this Capitol building. 